Good evening, everybody. I'm just gonna be doing a real casual episode tonight. I've been I've been saving some uh, space, some educational gifts, astronomy themed, space oriented gifts in my Reddit saved folder. And uh, there we go. So we are uh, just gonna browse. See what we can learn through these very informative gifts. And um, after I light these, I'll show you the radar. So it looks like we got quite a few storms brewing out there. And there we are. All right. Got to set the mood, you know. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's, um, I periodically browse Reddit, like billions of you out there, and I find a lot of, uh, there's actually a lot of really information-dense GIFs. Um, here we go. Let's show you guys what's going on. Do it. Change it to three times. A little faster. And I'm just north of where you see Palm Beach right there. So. Actually, right now it's you're really quiet outside, so you might hear some cat cracks, cracks of thunder out there as we uh, some of these heads, storm heads start developing out there you might hear some rain and some really good lightning cracks yesterday actually uh, a few days ago, this whole week's been pretty intense with storms I actually had to buy a new surge protector to protect my new electronic equipment and here we are alright so I've saved probably man over a hundred of these so we got plenty of material to sift through and um, that's exactly what we're gonna do and we'll just comment on each one see if we can't find something interesting about about the universe through watching educational educational gifts and um, let's see in case we want to write write something down or work through a uh, an idea sketch something out I also brought my book my research book of ideas which magically makes me get to about 70 or 80 percent of an idea and uh, just saps all my motivation to finish it so I'm blaming my procrastination on this book for sure so if we do, we got plenty of paper here if we want to sketch some things out later, which I may or may not do. So, trying to figure out what would be best for holding the phone. Maybe something like that. Alright, so, this one that I had on loop, and we got plenty of them, so. I'll uh, run through them as quick as I can, or at least in a timely manner. I enjoyed this one right here. This is footage of the ISS orbiting the Earth. As far as I know, I think it's on the ISS. Um, I enjoy how thin it reveals the atmosphere to be. Just how 
guess you see let's how do we do that? I guess we're seeing the glow of uh, the uppermost, the last densest bit of the atmosphere. And it's just revealing how in much of a, a bubble we really exist. And how that is our ocean. That is the thin little layer that we all rely upon to breathe in and out and sustain us minute, minute to minute and second to second. All right, next is some of these I might have to hold out because they're just low resolution to begin with. This is actually a prototype, Project Orion. I think it was from the 70s, Carl Sagan talked about it in his Cosmo series. It was a prototype for propulsion by um, pulses of, this isn't nuclear energy here, but the final idea was to equip a very, very large spaceship with nuclear energy and do set off uh, kind of micro detonations, nuclear blasts to pro propel it and gain acceleration in space. Here's just a, uh, it's just a really cool, you know, look at astronauts tripping on the moon. It's funny watching them fall, but it's also, for me, it's pretty, um, pretty cool to think about what it's going to be like once we actually get back on the moon and uh, maybe our children hopefully our children's children will be able to uh, be freely you know making cheap flights to the moon like we'd fly across the United States or the world overseas these days Like how you see when he kicks the sand out, just how slow the gravitational acceleration, the force on objects is on the moon. Um, yeah, that was just, I thought this was pretty cool because it's the moon blocking the sun uh, for certain sections of the earth. Here it's North America going from kind of Alaska to Florida right here. Here, this for me is really, really interesting because you, you never, objects in the cosmos are so large, you never on human time scales are able to see any movement generally unless it's a very relatively small, fast-moving object like the planets or comets or, um, you know, with advanced telescopes we can see stars orbiting very rapidly around the center of the um, Milky Way galaxy, the black hole, Sagittarius A. Just because those, their velocities are their velocities are so high, but here, this is the Crab Nebula, a supernova remnant. I guess this GIF, I don't know, uh, I suppose all you really need is to take one picture a year and compile ten different pictures to create this one, but you can see by Detlef Hartman, 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 we can see um, a very, very slight movement of the gases expanding, and you see right in the middle here, you see some, uh, maybe I'll use my pen 
there you see some aberrations in the the gaseous remnants I guess I don't know if those are shock waves still kind of reverberating outward but um, it's pretty amazing to think that this thing this whole thing crab nebula well I don't want to Yes, let's see how uh, how far across it really is. Direct link the other day. 1050. Right, this, so this is a thousand years old. So, all the gas, gas and plasma, or superheated gas, and by the explosion from the supernova is a thousand years old almost a thousand years old Let's see if it tells us just how far apart how far it's going over the past 10 years I worked to create my astronomical life work at my remote observatory at the Emberger Aim in Austria One decade time lapse. 368 frames with a total integration time of 32 hours. Combined with 10,000 frames into 10 color images. One for each year. Strong high dynamic range processing and sharpening reveals the first style movement. Man, look at that. Yeah, and that's 150 years. Or 100 years? Yeah, 150 years of projected expansion. I agree, I agree. Okay. We're here in the thunderstorms really start to grow out there. Let me look up the Crab Nebula. I gotta know how far, how large it really is. Let's see. Crab Nebula. So it's about roughly about 7,500 light years from us. Radius is about five and a half light years. Wow. Man. That's amazing. So I'm gonna quit some maps so that my computer's fan doesn't start winding up. Alright, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing to think that a thousand years ago, that thing 
erupted, and we can still watch it expanding. Or actually, if we saw it a thousand years ago, and 7,500 light years away, that means it erupted about 8,500 light years, 8,500 years ago. And then here is a before and after of Neil Armstrong's footprint on the moon. So that was pretty cool. You can see two rocks. So you know it's the same space. It's going to be cool, like, uh, you know, 200 years from now or whatever. We're going to go back and find that and, uh, you know, probably put a um, some sort of transparent barrier around it so it never gets disturbed. And then, of course, I got to have Elon Musk's Tesla in orbit around Earth here. I just think that's... It's amazing. How much this... This genius has accomplished. And hopefully he uh, accomplishes much, much more. I hope he really is able to allow humans to set, set foot on, on Mars. That's going to be amazing. And this right here I enjoyed because it's my, my home state, but from Cape Kennedy, Cape Canaveral, Kennedy Space Center, a weather, geostationary weather satellite, which means that um, geostationary just means that it's orbiting so far away from Earth. that um, it stays fixed over the same spot on Earth. And uh, it's able to monitor continuously, you know, the same region. And uh, especially during hurricane season right now, where we have a lot of activity coming off the coast of Africa. <laughs> I don't know why I was just trying to show the, uh, the zone that it monitors, but um, yeah, lots of hurricanes out there. Maybe we'll make this into a hurricane. Hopefully we never see one this big in our lifetimes. Lifetimes. That'd be the perfect storm right there. It was weird though the other day that um, something I've never seen before is a tropical storm formed off the coast of Virginia. Usually they form right along the equator and then they move up the coast in that general direction, but um, one formed all the way up, kind of in the, it's called the Mid-Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic region, it's pretty interesting, but yeah, most of the time, uh, most satellites that are in low Earth orbit, LEO, these guys will, uh, They orbit the Earth, like the ISS. It orbits the Earth much faster than the Earth's actual rotation. So like every 90 minutes, the ISS goes around the Earth. But these um, geostationary satellites, they, uh, they orbit 
the exact, of course, by design, the orbit at the exact rotation of the uh, of the Earth, so that they always stay over the same spot. It's pretty cool. Anyways, <laughs> that was a long way of saying that this is a geostationary satellite that is watching the launch of another weather satellite. It's a sister satellite. Goes east. Yeah, maybe. I should change that to uh, geo. I forget what that stands for. Geostationary orbiting. I don't know. But it goes east, captures the launch of its sister satellite, goes south from Cape Canaveral on Thursday. Next, we got. So th this, okay, yeah, sorry, I hadn't read this um, before I started fooling around with the, the focus and exposure. These are exoplanets, and this is amazing. So we artificially, on one of our satellites, we artificially blocked out the sun, and and we. Um, Exoplanets orbiting HR 8799. And this is just a, a low resolution GIF, so we're not going to be able to see too much detail, but if I speed it up, you can actually see three different, and maybe even four and five out here. So it looks like we have five different exo exoplanets, meaning extra solar planets, planets that do not orbit our sun, our star, or outside of our solar system. And that's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Alright, this... Here we are looking at a shock wave on the surface, speaking of the sun, on the surface of our star. And right here, a solar flare erupts. Right there, and you see the shock wave reverberate, reverberate along the uh, star's surface out there. I think it's just very neat to um, remember that the sun, the very source of life, this, this massive gravitationally bound ball of nuclear reactions. Oh, there we go. There's the thunder. I'm sure you guys can start to hear it now. It's starting to crack out there. But the, uh, it, it's cool to think that our sun unlike what we see from Earth as this unchanging ball of light is actually this very dynamic luckily <laughs> gravitationally corralled ooh, there we go it's a very dynamic thing with you know, it's just this this ball of light and it seems like a, a unified body, but it's really this 
somehow stable um, just ball of nuclear reactions continually exploding atoms gravitationally bound by such a tight under such tight pressure and compression that they get squeezed together even though it doesn't happen very often it's pretty interesting like it takes millions of atoms that miss each other for one atom one set of atoms usually hydrogen to hit at just the right angle and to uh, create a nuclear reaction synthesize into um, it's it's nuclei into two from one two separate single proton nuclei into nuclei with uh, either heavier hydrogen or heavier uh, a heavier element with two protons I think oh I'm gonna start a fire <laughs> so if we have two protons colliding They either produce a helium atom, which now is the second lightest element, helium, two hydrogen atoms with one singular proton, but the nucleus can also have a subatomic particle called a neutron and a neutron at least one way of a neutron occurring is that it results from a transformation of a proton losing its positive charge and uh, by a proton a hydrogen proton and then this electrically neutral particle if it combines with a another hydrogen hydrogen atom then these two will I'm probably giving you guys a heart attack over here then these two will combine to form a a hydrogen atom with two atomic um, what are they called? two nucleic particles? I don't know but it's essentially a, a heavier a heavier uh, hydrogen hydrogen atom what's that? is it, is it deuterium? Man, now I just I just have to know. So I'm so interested now. zoom in there yeah cool so here two hydrogen atoms 
undergo nuclear fusion. They fuse together. And the gray one represents a uh, electrically neutral particle. And the reds are positive, electrically positive. So it's just a heavier atom. A neutron, positron. So a neutrino and a positron is what happens when two regular hydrogen atoms combine. And then, once you have two um, heavier hydrogen atoms combining, they will have uh, form a helium nucleus, which is defined by having two protons. And in this case, helium-3 means that uh, it has three nucleic particles in there. I, that's not the right word. What the heck is it called? Nuclear subatomic particles. Maybe it's subatomic particles. Nucleons, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe they're called nucleons. Anyways, subatomic particles. We can at least call them. Another little burst. Storms are approaching out there. But, um, we have, uh, yeah, the initial reaction that the most popular, most common reaction that takes place in stars is the universe is overwhelmingly made up of hydrogen, and then secondly, second most abundant atom in the universe is the result of the proton-proton chain reactions, the fusions of the hydrogen isotope. Isotope just means a uh, an atom with a an added subatomic neutron instead of the proton Instead of just the proton in the nucleus, now it has a neutron in there, but it doesn't change the the atom's essential characteristics, I guess. It just makes that that element, hydrogen, here in this case, a little heavier. And then we got helium, can even have up to, as uh, I guess helium could have its variations, its different types of isotopes are having two protons, two protons with, and then two protons with a neutron, or two protons with um, two neutrons, even. But an anyways, back to the gas. <laughs> okay, so... Um, man, I got like so many of these too. I want to get through, uh, many more than we, we currently have. This is the Hubble Deep Field. the that's the moon in the night sky so it zooms out to give you an idea of just how small of a region how small of an angular region if the moon is like what do they say the moon's like six degrees across I think normally so if the moon is six degrees across we zoom into where the Hubble deep field is. Oh my god, come on. Alright, there we go. It's a very, very small region of the sky. And this is, uh, this right here is just a really cool view 
of the um I just like how how many stars you can see out there when you're in the mountains when you're away from all the light pollution that most cities will uh, give you I'm not from a major city so I can see an average amount of stars but um you you actually see the sky like that if you are from a city just so you know you got to uh, before you die at some point at some point you got to go out there in the country and um really look up at the night sky it's a beautiful really really beautiful sight and here we go another exploding star time lapse this one is look at that that's so amazing wow let's see if we can see So this one is about three times as far as the Crab Nebula. The radius is estimated to be about 380 times the sun. And uh, let's turn the brightness down. And it was much larger at one point. Almost 1,500 times that of the sun. Just about, about the uh, orbital distance of Jupiter. Wow. V... 838 Monos Rodas V838 Mon <laughs> Maybe I should say V838 Mon He's a red star in the constellation Monoceros About 20,000 light years 6 kiloparsecs From the sun And previously Unknown star Was observed in early 2002 Experiencing a major outburst and was possibly one of the largest known stars for a short period following the eruption. Wow. Very cool. Alright, the next one is... Let's get this. This one, I'm sure you guys have all seen it. It's made news back in the day. Or back in the day. A couple of years back. Or maybe it was just a year or two ago. But, uh... This... Is the view that a spacecraft has sitting on an actual asteroid. It's amazing that it's on an asteroid. So amazing. Just look at that. Wow, that's so incredible. It's incredible that it looks so similar to Earth. You got the rocks and all that. It's just like how loosely bound. It makes me think, like, what if we, like, how much force would it take? What's the escape velocity of that asteroid? If I picked up one of those rocks and just threw it in the air, would it, would it just not come back? <laughs> Let's see, what is this? Saturn's moon? Mimas? Mimas? I just like this one because, uh... I like that the crater 
from obviously a really huge asteroid impact at some point in the past. It's so big that it went into the planet and the center of the crater flew back out, you know? Okay, and then, oh yeah, this one right here. You got Saturn emerging from behind the moon. And I'm not sure. I guess this was taken from the Earth. Because you get a lot of, you know, atmospheric aberrations. A lot of, um, distortion in the light rays. But that's just a really beautiful picture. And then here we have one of the Apollo programs, uh, what are they called, the uh, lunar modules, one of the lunar modules taking off from the moon, just blowing things away, and look, you can see the low gravity of the moon is just allowing things to uh, fall to the ground much more slowly than they would on Earth. See the flag getting blown out. And you can see the, uh, the shadow of the capsule right there. Very cool that they, they're able to capture it at that angle. That's uh, very beautiful. And then fast forward 50 years, I guess. Here's an astronaut doing a typical, it's called a um, EAV, extra, or EVA, extra vehicular activity, hooking themselves up, and, uh, and just going on a walk, taking a little stroll. Um, how many miles up are they? So roughly 250 miles up. This guy is 250 miles up. That's a long fall. God, that's so amazing. And then this, everybody interested in space has already seen this one from uh, a much better version of this one. From movie Interstellar. This is a visualization of a black hole. And apparently these on the bottom and top are simply the light from behind. So the accretion disk, all this, this matter just outside the event horizon, which is where the uh, last bit of light is able to escape. So anything beyond, closer to the black hole than the radial distance of the event horizon does not make it back out, even its light. No longer has enough velocity enough speed to escape the gravitational pull of this black hole. But these, so just like a uh, just like a planet like Saturn with, with its rings. So we have Let's say we have this. Um. So 
So if we have a, a normal planet, and we view the rings, you know, just as uh, the rings are a conglomeration of particles that are uh, orbiting the planet in a roughly the same plane. So you don't have too many objects floating way up here, you know, like 20 miles or 20,000 miles above the plane. Most of the objects are, have settled into the same plane. So even with the, um, the black hole, which is fully, uh, which is creating the same effect of whether it's a companion star, a companion star's mass falling into it, or, um, or just other random debris from nearby nebulas or whatever, it has a ton of stuff orbiting it sometimes, at least in this picture. Oh, look at that. Why don't I just do that? <laughs> nice. Get it lined up with the ring light. Very cool. It's my special effects right there. But yeah, this front side of the ring stays untouched optically, but the back side of the ring is the light. So if we were standing right here with our telescope, Ridiculously long arms. And we have our telescope allowing us to view it at a safe distance. Um, this front side right here would look like this. But these top and bottom would be the light rays bending over the top and from under the bottom. And, um, I guess. I mean, at least the way I understand it is that this black hole, the singularity of, you know, supermassive amounts of matter creating the distortion in space-time, which, um, again, I don't, I don't actually know what that means, but I understand that it just bends, it bends space so that the path of least resistance that light, you know, typically wants to, from a typical star, light typically wants to follow a straight line, path of least resistance to its, uh, its planets, but a black hole is bending space around it so much that the path of least resistance is no longer straight. So it's no longer straight, but it's this radically distorted trajectory. But, um, I don't know. I don't really quite understand how, um, I gotta do more research on that. How, you know, it would look from behind it. I guess it's just equally distributed. It's just bent so much that you can't really hide 
anything behind the object because it bends light so much that it you're seeing everything that exists physically behind the black hole so everything that is over here to an observer on the other side of the black hole is transparent although it's very distorted but it's still um, as long as it's luminous as long as it's giving off radiation and not completely in the dark observers on either side um, are going to be seeing at least a distorted view of what's going on on either side so if someone's over here they're going to see the light from this side doing the same thing above and below man that's so crazy Alright, well, anyways, hope I uh, didn't confuse you anymore. That's my limited understanding of it. Next is just a beautiful vic uh, picture of the Juno spacecraft orbiting Jupiter and doing a really, really close, although it's a little low resolution here, flyby. And if we if we do it from uh, from the other direction, it actually looks a little more uh, a little more menacing, minus the skipping and lagging. But uh, God, that's so amazing. Anyways, this. 1965, during a test of the Apollo launch escape system, Little Joe, <laughs> the Little Joe 2 booster begins to roll uncontrollably and breaks up. Ironically, the unanticipated failure provided for an excellent test of the launch escape system and this I just thought was cool watching the astronauts sleep look how their arms are just uh, just kind of weightless weightlessly uh, sitting there floating around Look at that one. He's in his fighting stance. That's funny. Alright, what else we got? And then SpaceX, of course. And we got the boosters. Sped up just a little bit, but... I mean, this is such a feat of engineering right here. 
so encouraging to see that uh, humans are so innovative. Curious how much of a part, how much of this, of that particular aspect of the the rocket's landing was Elon's idea. So cool. And then again, a great image, and this one's actually pretty high, high res, of the little corpuscles, corpuscles, corpuscules, well, whatever, uh, the granulation, highest resolution video of the sun ever taken, the granulation of the individual cells on the sun. And look, look out, they're just slowly morphing. And the sun is, um, God, what's the sun's width? That's so amazing. What's the... So if the Earth is almost 13,000 kilometers across, the Sun is 1.3, almost 1.4 million kilometers across. So that's uh, probably about a hundred, a hundredfold increase in the diameter of the Sun. That's Jesus. That's so. Sun is 864, 864,000 miles across in, in diameter. So amazing. Alright, and then uh, this is just some Falcon 9 boosters uh, being put together. This is another flyby, I think by Juno, of Jupiter, and this, this is, uh, you know, we're not riding around in flying cars yet, but, I mean, come on, that looks like something out of a movie, and that's real footage of our star system's largest planet. Our largest planet, our gas giant, Jupiter, and we sent a spacecraft to fly that close to it. <sighs> My exposure keeps going way up. Man, that's so, that's so amazing. And you know what's cool to think about is that at this distance, I would bet that we, we'd be able to see pretty much the whole Earth right there. Just to give you an idea of how, how large Jupiter actually is, we'd probably be seeing the entire sphere, one entire side of the sphere of, uh, of the Earth. 
Jupiter over here is just this 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 massive wall of clouds to us oh this is cool speed of light that's the inaccurate you know gif graphic of how how long it takes light to actually reach the moon with accurate accurate sizes of the earth and the moon and the accurate distance the average because the moon's orbit is elliptical but uh, look at that it's about two and a quarter two hundred and twenty five thousand miles or three hundred and eighty four thousand kilometers between the earth and the moon it takes 1.255 seconds for light to get from the earth to the moon surface to surface in real time that's so Alright guys, I think I'm going to call it quits. Um, i got to go let the dogs in before it really starts to r rain out there. Hope, hope you guys enjoy this, as always. I don't know why I said that. I hate that phrase, as always. I should mean it the same way. I should mean it just as much every time. I, uh... Yeah, I just am glad I got to share these with you. I've uh, I've been saving these for uh, some of these at least for a while, and um, I just thought it was kind of cool, a little bit insightful about the uh, the nature of the universe and scales and speed and velocities and uh, you know what we know, some of the space technology that we have going on, whether it's SpaceX or, uh, you know, the ISS, and, um, yeah, my weak attempts at, um, <laughs> trying to, trying to explain random things, and I just kind of like to draw, really, it was just an excuse to doodle, I guess, I like doing that, um, thanks for, uh, any of you Patreons watching right now, I just, uh, Again, I gotta say thank you. Your support is amazing. It's really, really amazing. Oh, I think this one's about to go up. But, um... And even, even for those of you who uh, are just watching and, you know, don't have the means or whatever or just don't feel like supporting... That's okay too. Um, I just appreciate you guys watching. Um, you know, liking the video lets me know that you enjoyed it. Commenting says you really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for all the love. Thanks for all the continued um, just time and appreciation, guys. It means a lot. Coming up very, very soon, we have a. Uh, we're going to have a little special episode about Bob Ross. For those of you guys who are interested in this guy at all, this one, um, I couldn't pass this up. I saw this in the supermarket aisle. So I wish you guys a good night. Take care. And we'll see you next time.